Thank you very much uh, for joining us today. And I'm very pleased and honored to be joined by uh, Tony for the second time. And we had this uh, webinar last year based on the feedback that you all gave us. You really enjoyed it. So I hope you will enjoy this session as well. Good morning, Tony. How are you? Good. Thanks, Pierre. Good, good, good to be online again. Well, thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, without further ado, we'll kickstart into the agenda for today. Um, you will hear just a few minutes from me uh, looking back on what Workspace has seen in terms of changes over the last year, quite a tremendous year in changes and revolutions. And we'll look quickly at our predictions. That's going to take about three, four minutes. And then I'll hand over to Tony, uh, who's the guest of honor. And I'm sure the only one you would like to hear from today. Um, so in terms of fact, yes, this last year has been um, absolutely focused on hybrid work and the changes that we've seen in the way people work and approach the offices. A few key stats on here, but broadly, the adoption of hybrid work patterns have been successful for companies and companies who have adopted hybrid work patterns have uh, broadly um, seen as a positive change. Um, what we can see in terms of where we expect people to work, this is data coming from Gartner, where we see where exclusive remote will happen, hybrid and fully on site. And we expect hybrid to be the major model that companies followed, uh, followed by 59% of companies generally. Uh, some facts about the office market. Obviously, we have seen a reduction in footprint and that has led to an increase in vacancy in Auckland to 6.6% in the prime buildings. So these are the, the best type of, type of assets and 16.6% in the secondary stock. So what we're seeing here is a flight to quality, but equally at the same time, a reduction in footprint, which has increased even in the prime sector, um, the vacancy. Uh, different story for Wellington, but bear in mind, post earthquake, there's a lot of buildings there that are not fit for, um, uh, for purpose that cannot be occupied. So that's putting also pressure on the vacancy. Uh, we're seeing a reduction in lease terms. And what we're seeing overseas is a very interesting trend that's starting to happen in the US market is occupancy based rental, where basically landlords offer a rental that's sometimes 30% of market. And the balance of that rent comes from um, swipe cards of employees using it. So they're taking the risk and they're allowing uh, lower rents to incentivize tenants to come back if their employees use the space, then the rent goes up. Um, we're seeing growth in sustainability. 13% uh, of landlords in New Zealand actually want to transform proactively their assets to be uh, greener, whilst only 6% of tenants are seeking green building. But we anticipate that's going to change. Um, some major factors as well, the construction costs that have increased broadly 10% um, year on year. I'm sure, Tony, you'll have more details on this. And we're seeing also the key drivers for employees to come to office are quality of space, locations, amenities are their main uh, top choices. Um, finally, an opportunity that we're really excited about in terms of hybrid work is the opportunity to improve your bottom line. Because traditionally, uh, companies have carried a lot of surplus real estate, 48% on average utilization is pre-pandemic, um, how the leased asset was utilized. We're seeing here uh, with some modeling, very interesting cost reduction that can happen with adoption of hybrid or hybrid plus flex, which is the use of um, on-demand service office of, as, a, as a, an addition to your core lease facilities. Finally, our predictions for next year, we think that flexible and ready to lease space will represent 30% of the total stock in the long term. That's gonna take time to to happen and um, there will be more legislation on sustainability and green leases. Net zero construction capabilities for firms like ourselves will become paramount. Office building will become more integrated, offering amenities, shared meeting rooms and conference rooms, uh, on-demand space as well as a way to improve utilization for occupiers and attract more tenants. We'll see large corporates uh, really adopting new metrics to measure the impact of real estate, mostly utilization, return on investment for their fit up investment, sustainability, and ENPS. And we think finally hybrid complemented by flex offices will be the dominant model. That's it for us now. If you'd like to learn more about this, please by all means give us give us a call. We'd love to chat um, and discuss how hybrid can work better for your business. But without further ado, um, I'm introducing the guest star of today, Tony. 
Over to you. Thank you very much. All right. Look, thanks very much for that, uh, Pierre. And uh, yeah, thanks everybody for being online there. So I'll just check Pierre. It's coming through okay with me talking? Yep. Yep. Okay. That's all good. Rightio. So, hey, this afternoon in uh, just under three hours time, we've got the Reserve Bank going to announce its uh, review uh, of the uh, official cash rate. And uh, you'll have seen all the expectations out there. It's going to go up by 0.75% or 0.5%. I mean, personally, I think it's a bit of a toss of a coin, really, as to what exactly they're going to do. Um, and my interest is more in the words that they are going to use. Are they going to increase their degree of worry about inflation? Are they going to say, hey, maybe we'll take a bit of a slow down here and just wait for some evidence of the impact of the interest rate rises uh, to come along. But pretty much whatever they say, don't be thinking that somehow we're settling into a nice new equilibrium now. There's high certainty about what the uh, operating environment for your business is going to be um, going forward. Every single monetary policy tightening cycle, every time, you know, uh, now, in the future, in the past, when we have a central bank uh, raising interest rates, it's completely experimental. You never know for any time how high interest rates will have to go, how long they will have to stay there in order to get that particular cycle's inflation back down to the target range, which for New Zealand is 1% to 3%, and you know, 2% is explicitly what the Reserve Bank is, uh, is tasked with trying to stay close to. And if you think about the fact that the last time we had a tightening cycle in New Zealand was 2004 into 2007, that's sort of what we have got to go on. Our picks for where interest rates to, will go are based on what happened before the global financial crisis. Well, you know, if you think back over that period of time, one and a half decades ago, I think the iPhone might have only just been released in about 2008. Um, the world has changed dramatically, dramatically uh, since uh, one and a half decades ago. So don't be thinking that whatever the Reserve Bank says this afternoon, you can be highly certain about where interest rates are going to go, because certainly I'm not going to be uh, highly certain. And this is just, I guess, one aspect of the operating environment we find ourselves in now. The certainty we used to have in terms of the 1970s, uh, up in the 1980s there for a while, um, it's completely gone down the gurgler. None of us know what tonight's news is going to bring with regard to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. None of us know if the North Koreans are going to test a new ICBM and this one goes off course and it lands in Tokyo or something you know, truly out outrageous. You have to run your business from a point of view of predictions are good as a starting point, but you have to concentrate your attention on being able to identify when your expectations are proving to be wrong, when you need to adapt to a different sort of environment. And there's a way I've been describing this for some time, and it's if you think about somebody deciding to be a farmer. Now, nobody says, I'm going to be a farmer, and this is going to be a comfortable way in which to uh, make some uh, money for my retirement, my family, etc. You become a farmer because you are explicitly accepting the challenge of not knowing from one season to, to the next what the weather's going to be, what the interest rates will be, what the exchange rate will be, what the uh, commodity prices will be, what new pests and diseases will come along. But you accept the challenge with high confidence in your ability to adapt. And that, of course, is what the world is starting to do now when we're talking about climate change. People are having to adapt what they do uh, to that. And for your businesses as well, clearly you have to adapt to the changing environment um, that you are operating in. And one of the biggest changes in that environment is actually something that started back before the global financial crisis. This is partly why I've started out talking about monetary policy. The last time was a proper tightening was pre-GFC. Ahead of the global financial crisis and our own 2008 recession in New Zealand, which the Reserve Bank put us into before the global financial crisis came along, the unemployment rate in New Zealand was down to 3.4%. And I remember back at the time, talking with different you know, business groups, obviously not webinars back at the time, that technology didn't really exist, but I would talk about the fact that we no longer had a great excess supply of skilled, motivated labour in the New Zealand economy, that if you were to look to change your workforce to increase the size of it by putting an ad in the paper, you couldn't do what you used to be able to do, which was you know, put the ad in, get all the applications in, sort the wheat from the chaff, and get on board some relatively good, motivated, 
motivated, maybe compliant sort of people there. I talked about the way that that had disappeared. And I talked about maybe what businesses could do to handle that you know, new operating environment. Now, that sort of all went down the gurgler for a while, or maybe more accurately, it went off the radar for all of us because the economy went into recession, the GFC came along, our economy shrank by about 3% over that period of time, and New Zealand's unemployment rate went from 3.4% to 6.5% quite quickly, and we stayed at 6.5% for about three years. So nobody was really thinking about medium to long-term changes in their business on the basis of the labour they need not being readily available. From 2010, 11, the economy's picking up, the unemployment rate starts to go down and we get ourselves to 2014, 2015, and the unemployment rate is down to 5%. And I start talking again about difficulties businesses are, are experiencing um, hiring staff and maybe what you do about it. But it sort of went off the radar again, the structural shift in availability of labour, not so much because the unemployment rate went, went up. It didn't. It kept on going down until uh, it reached 4% just before we went into the pandemic. But what we saw was a great surge in the number of migrants coming into New Zealand on working visas from 2014 through to 2019. New Zealand's average uh, long-term population growth rate per annum is about 1.2% population boost each year. We were running at 2% or just over or just under for about a five year period from roughly 2014 into about 2019. And what that meant was that in the business sector, there was high confidence that if the labor one wanted wasn't immediately there, you were going to be able to get it from um, overseas and government policy seemed relatively open to a good number of people uh, coming into the country. So I was definitely talking about the labor market uh, tightening up, but like I said, I think for a lot of businesses, the necessary changes to allow for a structural shortage of labour uh, were not being undertaken. Pandemic comes along, we are every single one of us on the planet expecting uh, uh, pretty bad times for our economies. Everyone is forecasting the unemployment rate to going up, so no need to greatly change your business uh, uh, for a shortage of labour any longer. But of course, in New Zealand, not so much in other countries, and certainly not, at, for instance, in the United Kingdom, which is still smaller than it was pre-pandemic, uh, New Zealand, Australia, we regained our pre-pandemic level of economic activity within about six to nine months. And businesses that had actually laid off some staff in April, May of 2020, went back to try and hire them again and found they'd already got jobs elsewhere. And New Zealand's unemployment rate only temporarily, quickly went to 5.2% and then fell away relatively quickly. And all of this year, basically, the unemployment rate has been 3.3%. Now, it pays very strongly to note that in Australia, the unemployment rate is 3.4%. America's got about 3.7%. You're looking at rates like that in many of the countries where we have traditionally sourced um, our skilled, semi-skilled, et cetera, labor from. So that's, that's a key point to note that we're not in a unique position here with the degree of tightness in the labor market that you are seeing. But we do suffer a bit in New Zealand in, in sort of line with what's happening overseas in believing that, oh, this is just a pandemic thing. Once the borders have opened up and now they've opened up, we're going to see a return of a good number of migrants coming in from overseas. And so I don't need to much change my business, the way I run things, et cetera, because the pandemic induced a big decline in the unemployment rate um, is going to be reversed with help from interest rates rising, because of course that's one thing our Reserve Bank wants to see happen, the unemployment rate um, to go up. But because labour markets are so tight overseas, the push factor for people already working offshore to come to New Zealand is not particularly strong. And in fact, if you consider that if somebody's coming down this part of the planet, uh, they're basically choosing between New Zealand and Australia. Well, of course, in Australia, the demand for staff is exceptionally strong. Uh, you're looking at, uh, for instance, in the electricity sector, massive investments need to be undertaken in renewable electricity generation, 10,000 kilometres worth of, uh, line, of transmission lines to put in, military facilities to be built up, uh, railway lines, uh, new motorway systems, etc. There's a lot of investment to be undertaken in Australia over an extended period of time. And that first of all, is going to drag a lot of people out of New Zealand, and it's going to provide an encouragement for people thinking of coming down to the Southern Hemisphere for an alternative lifestyle to go to Australia um, instead of coming to New Zealand. 
And on top of all that, we also have the aging of the population here and overseas. Baby boomers retiring, naturally uh, leaving the workforce. And so what I want to emphasize you know, right at the start here is uh, I haven't yet given an outlook for the economy, but what I'm emphasizing is that the labor market change in New Zealand, the difficulty that you are experiencing finding staff, it is not just a pandemic thing. This is something that started one and a half decades ago, and it just got hidden for a while by the GFC and hidden for a while by an unsustainable uh, level of net migration into New Zealand. Now it's basically right out there in everybody's faces, and we do need to change the way we operate in order to recognise that. And one thing, to, key thing to recognise here is that in New Zealand, and I guess in other countries as well, we've become used to labour the employees being relatively compliant. I mean, we haven't had a high degree of unionism in New Zealand since the early uh, 1980s, but the power in the relationship is definitely on the other foot now. People increasingly realise that if they're not receiving the remuneration or just the respect or the working conditions that they want in the company that they are in, they can fairly easily go down the road and pick up a probably better paying job uh, than what they have got at the moment. The risk of staff churn has increased if you are not up to speed with the remuneration, with the working conditions, uh, health and well-being policies. People focus a lot on that generation X, X, uh, y, Z, sorry, uh, particularly particularly uh, uh, all the go about that one, you need to recognise that there is greater power to employees and that your risk to your operations going forward, your reputation, the brand, et cetera, by not being up to speed with how to manage staff um, has increased because of the risk of loss if, of people at basically whatever level um, in your organisation. And so what that means is that much as there are many people around like myself who say, I really think uh, people need to get back into the office. I think it's the squeaky wheel that gets uh, oiled. A part of me is sort of respectful of uh, Elon Musk there telling people you've got to get back to the office. Well, you know, the simple uh, fact of the matter is uh, if people are with a business and they say you've all got to come back to the office and instead they prefer a lifestyle of only maybe three days a week in the office, then you know, those people are going to shift to where that sort of flexibility is offered. So I was interested in the uh, the chart that uh, Pierre had there uh, at the start, um, showing the proportions of, of, of expectations businesses of how many people would be, uh, businesses would be uh, purely remote, a mixture, and then no remote, you know, working um, at all. The world has changed. And so it's interesting to see the adoption in American commercial property sector of uh, the, uh, the the leases that they're going to charging, as you say, Pierre, 30% for the uh, what the previous uh, uh, lease would be and then per person coming in whatever formula they've got worked out there you know the commercial property sector will adapt to this change towards uh, uh, more remote working just as we saw adaptation ahead of the pandemic with regard to uh, first of all the shared office space obviously that was a strongly growing area which was had a bit of a dent obviously during the the, the worst of the pandemic but also the uh, floor plates around New Zealand sort of being carved up into smaller um, allocations so somebody could come in they don't want to lease the whole floor but they're able to lease a quarter of it a fifth of it or whatever like that that was certainly a development and I saw occurring in Auckland and Hamilton um, in particular. So I just want to emphasize at the start before I give any outlook really for what the economy is going to do, it's, it's, it's almost like, you know, even if I were to say, oh, there's a recession coming next year, frankly, given my view on the labor market, that presents an opportunity maybe to secure some extra staff in expectation of the upturn, which already for, always follows a recession. So do I see a recession in the New Zealand economy in the, in the near future? Now, that's mainly what you're reading out there. And that would be the easy thing for me to say. But frankly, I don't think we're going to have a recession. Or if we do have a recession, it's going to be a relatively shallow one. And I don't think it's going to cause the sort of dent in the labour market as we saw over 2008, 2009, the unemployment rate up by 3%. I think the unemployment rate will go up, but maybe only from the 3.3% we've got at the moment towards 4.5% if you're lucky. And I say that because the Reserve Bank explicitly is noting that the level of employment in New Zealand is above sustainable levels. You reverse that, basically what they're saying is the unemployment rate is too low. At this level, it's going to be generating a degree of perfectly natural free market 
upward pressure on wages, which flows through to upward pressure on prices, it's going to generate too much inflation for the Reserve Bank's uh, target of 1% to 3%. So it's like we have to expect that the unemployment rate um, will go uh, uh, up. Now, in particular, one thing to note here is that there is a wages response in the New Zealand labour market that is not happening to the same degree overseas. Our labour market is one of the most deregulated uh, in the world, far more so than um, uh, Australia in particular, uh, not necessarily as much as in the United States. But the rate of growth in wages in New Zealand has accelerated from about 3.5% a year ago to about 8.5% over the past year. Australia has had nothing remotely like that. There's more rigid structures with a greater role for the unions and many large companies, um, et cetera. In New Zealand, we, we have a lot more individualized contract bargaining and we've seen quite a surge in the wages are being paid and you know even if you're looking at the uh, lower uh, uh, wage sector there you're looking at the likes of countdown giving a 19 one nine percent increase in remuneration paid to its staff over a uh, two-year period for instance so you know much as i'm of the view that maybe the interest rates the mortgage rates don't go up all that much more from where they are at the moment this tightness of the labor market is generating a wages response. It is adding to the upward pressure on business costs more generally, on top of materials costs going up, uh, supply chain disruptions, insurance costs are going up, uh, local authority rates moving higher, all these sorts of things out there. So there is still a reasonable degree of inflationary pressure. And that's why many people are believing that we could easily get 0.75% increase in the interest rate this afternoon. If the Reserve Bank do it, I, I, I think it's relatively easy to understand why they, uh, why they will do it. When I look ahead to where the New Zealand economy is going, the, the negative factors are in the ascendancy. So I'm just going to have a little run through a list of some of the factors which are placing downward pressure on the pace of growth in the New Zealand economy. Some of them have been in operation. <clears throat> excuse me, some of them there is more to uh, uh, come along. So in no particular order of importance, we have a slowdown in world growth. Uh, we are an exporter. We get about 27% of our national income uh, derives from exports. So you would naturally expect if you're looking at world growth slowing down, not a recession. So generally there isn't a forecast of global recession, even though uh, the IMF three weeks ago said they expect about one third of the world economy to be in recession next year, the likes of the UK, uh, European Union, um, um, for instance. Uh, there is still a slowdown underway. So you put that on your list of, well, that sort of seems to be the thing businesses are going to worry about. It's going to make them a bit hesitant, maybe about capital spending. People are going to keep reading about it. Maybe that makes them a little bit cautious as well. So we've got the recession going on potentially overseas, but at least in some countries. Secondly, of course, the big new one is the soaring cost of living. The inflation rate is another broad way of saying the change in the cost of living for the average house hold over the past year, it's sort of within the ballpark of, of that 7.2% increase. We haven't seen that in three decades. It's obviously a shock to a lot of people. People still need to eat. And so increased money is having to go on the weekly uh, groceries as well as the ongoing utilities. And that's leaving less money available to be spending on other things. And so that means downward pressure on the sales of motor vehicles, spas, jet skis, uh, furniture, household appliances, all that sort of thing. And at the same time as we have people adjusting their spending because of the high increase in their, their, their cost of living, uh, we also have an ending of the two to two and a half year binge that you and I have been on because of the pandemic. As I said, uh, at the start of the pandemic, we all had negative outlook. We expected the unemployment rate to rise strongly. It went up a bit and then fell away relatively quickly. We got wage subsidies in New Zealand, soaring house prices, record low interest rates. We've been on a spending binge on spas and jet skis and home renovations. And so have people in most other economies as well. But you only need a new spa every four decades or so. You can only have so many jet skis to tow around behind the back of your car. And now sales of those things were always going to fall away after soaring they were always going to come back down again and that's what's happening around the world at the moment so that's another negative factor another one is the interest rates rising at the fastest pace most people have ever seen in that previous uh, monetary policy tightening from 2004 to 2007 it took about four years like four long years for fixed mortgage rates to rise less than three percent 
So very gradual tightening of monetary policy. This time around, fixed mortgage rates have gone up 3.5% or thereabouts in about 16 months. So this is an unusually uh, rapid tightening of monetary policy, and it's quite a shock to people as they're rolling off maybe 2.5% towards 6% or something, and there's still more of that negative effect to come through because in New Zealand, most people have been borrowing on one year fixed or two years fixed. There's still a lot to roll off and hit people's cash flows and depress consumer spending, et cetera, generally out there. So that's another negative. The net migration flows are slightly negative for New Zealand, but this one is not as bad as I thought it was going to be. And I'm starting to wonder if maybe we switch back to positive flows um, next year. The net loss of Kiwis is going up. On average, since 20, uh, 2000, uh, the annual net loss of Kiwis overseas is about 20,000. Um, we had a net gain of about 26,000 about a year or so ago. We're down to minus 10,000 or so, minus 12,000 there or thereabouts at the moment. And I think we're easily heading towards the average uh, in the very near future, minus 20,000 plus. But we're, of course, now with the borders open, we're starting to see people coming in on the working visas, et cetera, um, from over, overseas. So, you know, that's a negative for the moment, but I'm, I'm not viewing that quite as seriously as was the case, you know, uh, uh, six months ago. But it's, it's on my list anyway. Um, I've mentioned the supply chain difficulties, just making life very difficult for many businesses uh, out there, uh, maintaining profitability when you're having to wait for materials, materials prices are going up, you've signed set price contracts, you can't increase the price on your customer, et cetera. You know, there's a lot of things happening out there which are constraining the profitability of many businesses. If not now, I think there's still a lagged effect to come through there. I've mentioned the staff shortages, also making things difficult for the business sector generally out there. Asset prices, our wealth has declined in the past 12 months. House prices since the peak in November are down by about 12.4%. Uh, Equity prices, share prices, of course, are down. And crypto prices, if you have some of your uh, uh, wealth in uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, they've gone down about 75% or so over the past uh, year. Um, I, I'm hoping not too many people have been using these as the vehicle for getting ready for retirement or, or saving up a deposit for their, their, their house. But uh, obviously there's a backward move there. Negative equity tends to make us pull back on buying big lumpy consumer items, um, et cetera. I think I might have usually have, have one or two other things in there, including a bit of a credit crunch still underway. What it adds up to is, some of these are fairly big negatives. Some of them we have not seen for a long period of time. But at the same time, there is other stuff going on on the other side of the growth outlook ledger, things that insulate our economy, things that are a stimulus to growth. And I think that is the more interesting story. And in some ways, what I could do is just say, say to yourselves, uh, the negative side of the ledger, uh, you can take care of that by reading the morning newspaper because they're covering all that in ad infinitum of all the things going wrong. Let's concentrate on the things the newspapers aren't picking up on with regard to what is going right in the New Zealand economy or what, what at least is different this time around from in the past. So I'm going to start out there with five things which are completely different from what you've seen previously uh, with periods of either recession slash economic challenge in New Zealand. And just for your guide, that's sort of how I'm just really describing the environment that we're in and it's an environment of economic challenge, just like the farmers face, rather than unremittingly uh, uh, bad. So in no particular order of importance here, let's start with uh, the exchange rate. The Kiwi dollar is not overvalued, it is undervalued, it has not been overvalued for a great number of years. Normally for our economy, we're growing strongly, uh, inflation goes up, interest rates go up. In the cities, we don't care. Interest rates go up higher, bang, bang, bang. Uh, the currency goes through the roof. Eventually in the cities, we go, oh, 9.5% one year fixed term to fixed uh, mortgage rate seems a bit high. We pull back, the cities go into recession. The farmers are already in recession because the rising interest rates have pushed the currency through the roof. Not this time around. We have interest rates going up in New Zealand, but they are going up at a faster pace overseas. New Zealand's uh, Reserve Bank, they actually started uh, raising the official cash rate in October last year. They would have started in October, it was scheduled, but of course they had the um, uh, Delta outbreak, I think it was, come along. Other central banks, they waited much longer. We were the second central bank, uh, uh, our Reserve Bank, in the world to actually start the tightening cycle. So much as people like me like to stick the boot into the Reserve Bank and the governor every now and then, they were actually less bad 
than the likes of the Reserve Bank of Australia, which even right at the start of this year, we're still saying we don't intend raising interest rates until 2024. Overseas interest rates are increasing more rapidly, and so the Kiwi dollar has not gone through the roof. We're at a low level. That is very important for our export sector. It's added to inflation because falling New Zealand dollar has pushed up the prices of the things we import from overseas, including for the farmers. I mean, they may get a good exchange rate, good for export receipts, but they're paying more for the fertilizer, the tractors, you know, the, uh, all these other things um, on the other side. But this is something quite different from any previous down, downturn. Economic challenge is not preceded by the currency going through the roof. Um, Secondly, if I'm to be giving an outlook there, as I just did, of the world economy, much of it going to be in recession uh, next year. And like I say, that's generally a negative for the New Zealand economy. At no time in the past would I have said, and that means the number of visitors to New Zealand is going to boom. Logically, if think people are struggling overseas, they're not going to travel. But we've been locked down in one way or another for two, two and a half years, and people are just determined as much as possible to get out of wherever they've been and go somewhere else. We are all engaging in revenge travel. And for many people, that means not just hopping across from you know, one country in Europe to another or you know, uh, across to America. It means coming down here to New Zealand and Australia. And we got the data the other day showing that the number of people visiting in New Zealand in September was 58% of the number that visited in September 2019. Now that is a pretty strong proportional recovery in the tourism loss to New Zealand. And of course, we're all expecting even more people are gonna show up um, in the summer months. Uh, there isn't the capacity there to serve them like down in Queenstown or places to stay in motels in Rotorua, um, et cetera. But clearly this is a strong net positive for the New Zealand economy. And we've never seen that before when we have talked about a period of the world economy is slowing down. And so tourism is going to boom. Well, that's something quite different. A third factor here, nowhere near as big as the, uh, the, the first two I've mentioned, would be the foreign students returning. There's already some more back in New Zealand. I was listening to the radio this morning with regard to English language schools, looking to hire more staff, et cetera, because there's a, a good number of people coming for, uh, back to New Zealand for that. And of course, from the first semester next year, one would have to expect there's a lot more students at Auckland University, Canterbury, Otago, et cetera. It's going to sort of uh, uh, rejig, uh, uh, speed up the inner cities in these places, Auckland in particular. So it's, it's not a huge factor. Um, but it is definitely a net positive uh, for the economy. So I think I've got three uh, things there so far. A fourth one is that we look at what's happening overseas with energy prices rising strongly. We look at uh, global warming, meaning crops are not growing as well as they need to in the UK, in China, in Europe, flooding in Pakistan, Bangladesh, et cetera. You know, there's an international uh, uh, food crisis out there in terms of the prices, in terms of the physical availability of grains, uh, et cetera. Well, this is important for New Zealand because we are a food exporter. And although some of our prices have pulled back recently for uh, a we're looking at increasingly compromised production levels overseas. Australia's dairy production is falling away, uh, uh, for instance. And this is basically positive for New Zealand. It is the way we benefit from uh, especially Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, whereas Australia, it's more of the soaring energy prices. They see record levels, uh, are experiencing record levels of exports for coal and of gas um, in particular. So we are a food exporter. There is a food crisis internationally. This is positive for New Zealand and it's a uh, you know, fundamental uh, economic role. So we've not seen that uh, previously for economic downturns. And then the fifth to be big one, I've already spent 10, 12 minutes talking about right at, at the start. The labor market in New Zealand is extremely tight and the degree of easing up to come along is going to be relatively muted. What that means is there is a feeling of job security on the part of wage and salary earners that has never been there before in a New Zealand uh, period of economic challenge, recession, economic downturn. People realize that if they get laid off, they're going to be able to get another well-paying job, similarly paying job, relatively quickly. If people are having to stump up more for their mortgage because unfortunately they locked in you know, for one year at 2.49 and now they're rolling into 5%, they can uh, pick up extra work out there. There's a strong availability of part-time work in the retailing sector, in coffee shops, restaurants, you know, in, in tourism centers, et cetera. There's a shortage of rental accommodation in many locations, so opportunity to take in a border. 
These are important things in terms of they limit the crunch on consumer spending. They limit the degree to which people will pull back from the housing market, um, in particular, as interest rates go up and you know house prices are falling away. The, the job security, the lack of staff means that very few businesses are engaging in mass layoffs. I've only seen two over the past uh, four to five months. One, Rua Peihu Alpine ski lifts because of the snow situation. Uh, secondly, I think it was Auckland uh, Institute of Technology laying off 5% of their staff because they don't have enough foreign students coming through and because domestic students, well, they don't need to further their education. They can simply walk into a relatively good job um, straight away. So, you know, apart from that, there's definitely some catch-up corporate restructuring going on. So, you know, corporates restructure on at least a three-yearly basis. Many haven't been able to do that for two, two and a half years. There is some catching up of that happening in New Zealand and around the rest of the world uh, as well. But outside of that, we're not seeing the, the mass layoffs, which gives sort of a downward spiral to the economy. People get laid off, they cut spending. The shops lay off people, those people, they cut spending. The whole thing spirals down you know, for a, quite a way. That really isn't an operation this time around. And there's a few other sort of odds and sods here, which also say to me, this is a bit different from you know, downturns in the past. Uh, one would be the government giving uh, permanent visas to the many people on working visas in New Zealand. They initially estimated that with those people and their family members, it would be maybe 165,000 people. Uh, the latest estimate I saw two months ago was it was gonna add up to about 215,000 people. These are people predominantly in Auckland. Real estate agents already noted four months ago that they were seeing some of these migrants who'd gone from just the working visa to the permanent, uh, to the residency uh, uh, visa, were out there buying houses because now they were legally able to do so. Uh, but by, by no stretch of the imagination is the majority going to suddenly uh, move into the house buying market because most migrants are not in that sort of uh, financial position. But it's a positive, I like to say it when, when we get a lot of people in, in Auckland in an audience, for instance. There's also a backlog of work. Now, people think that, oh, interest rates are going up, oh, it's going to be a sort of decimation for a lot of sections of the economy, let's say, you know, home renovations, et cetera. Well, look, there's no shortage of people out there who are cashed up, who are making more money now that interest rates are going up. They may have had their wealth go down because of share prices, et cetera, but with their cash flows improving with, uh, you know, returns on term deposit rates are, are going up and their existing sort of net positive wealth position, no debt, they now see opportunities to maybe get some home renovations done, whereas they, they might have been looking at it over the past two years, but they saw all the stories about shortages of tradies, they've seen the stories about shortages of materials, bathrooms not able to be finished until the desired black taps finally show up in a container from China after waiting nine months, etc. There's backlog uh, uh, sitting out there. And it just pays to remember that, you know, it's, it's sort of common belief that when interest rates go up, everybody's shafted, everybody's getting hit by that. Well, first of all, one third of people in houses in New Zealand are renting, they're not affected by interest rates going up. I cannot find any consistent correlation between interest rates going up, rents rising at a faster pace, or interest rates going down, rents either falling or increasing at a slower pace. But We've got interest rates going up. It doesn't matter to one third of the population that is renting. Of the other two thirds of the population, one half of them no longer have a mortgage. So now we've got interest rate rises only affecting one third of the population. And many of them, they've had the mortgage 25, 15, 20, 17 years or whatever. It's relatively small and it doesn't matter all that much. And some, not as many as I would have liked to have seen, are on five year fixed at 2.99 or 3.49%. And for them, what does it matter where the interest rate are going at the moment. They locked in late 2020 or you know, much of 2021. It may not really matter. So it definitely does hit into a far smaller group than one is thinking out there, this tightening of monetary policy by the Reserve Bank. And that's where the Reserve Bank sort of needs to use strong words to try and scare everybody. If they have to rely on just the rising interest rates uh, you know, to, to hurt a, a particular group out there, and it means quite a bit of pain for those people, but for a lot of our, the rest of us, we're going, actually, I just put some money on term deposit for one year at 4.5%, so I'm sort of better off as a result of the interest rates going up. Anyway, I just wanted to point out there that there is a backlog of work to be done in a great number of sectors out there, so that's sort of 
an insulating factor. And let me just, just note, um, I don't think this one is as big in New Zealand as you might read overseas. In the United States, it's estimated that the extra savings that households have built up as a result of uh, some of their easing and spending in the pandemic, assistant measures from the, the, the federal state governments, et cetera, that these excess savings add up to between 1.2 and 1.7 trillion US dollars. They're providing an important buffer to the cutback in consumer spending in response to you know, house prices are easing, uh, uh, economic activity easing off, interest rates going up. In Australia, the numbers I've seen have been around 250 billion. In New Zealand, maybe it's only 30 uh, billion extra on the bank deposits than was the case if we'd seen the same rate of growth in term deposits as was happening in overall deposits uh, ahead of the pandemic. So that one I think in New Zealand is not particularly large. It's, it's there, it's far larger overseas. And let me just note there's zero pressure on the New Zealand government to engage in fiscal austerity. The ratio of gross government debt to GDP for the New Zealand government is about 36%. The United Kingdom is now 100%. Uh, the OECD average is about 70, 80% or so. There's not a single credit rating agency manager, a single uh, a fund manager overseas who looks at New Zealand's um, uh, level of government debt or the annual deficit and says, we think there need to be tax increases. We think there need to be spending cuts. There's a need for fiscal austerity. In so many of these other countries that have been basically uh, overspending for a long period of time, there is a need for fiscal austerity, but not in New Zealand. In fact, there's a chance of the opposite for the budget next year. Uh, there's a history of when Labor get to election year and they think they might lose the election, they open up the fiscal spigots. They let it all flow out in the May budget of the election year. Now, I don't believe Grant Robertson will do that, but we've already seen a bit of a fiscal easing. What was that, $180 million or so on early childcare subsidies, sort of income limits are being changed, et cetera, out there. I think there's going to be more of that in next year's uh, our budget. Now, here's the thing. Three months ago, when the Reserve Bank last released its set of economic forecast in a monetary policy uh, statement, they explicitly gave a warning to the finance minister saying, if there is an easing of fiscal policy, which stimulates your economy, there will be an interest rate response. I expect buried somewhere in the monetary policy statement this afternoon is going to be exactly the same sort of paragraph. graph. It could even be word for word, just a warning that if you get this easing in the budget next year or other times, then it means interest rates will be higher than would otherwise be the case. And that's one reason why you know we should still think interest rates have a bit further to go, but it more to me says that when interest rates start coming down, which I think is broadly the second half of next year through 2024, do not expect that they're going to fall away at a very rapid pace. If you don't have the economy going into a deep recession, you don't have very quick rapid falls in interest rates as we saw sort of 1998, 99 and 2008, 2009. It's, it's not going to happen like that. It's going to be a bit of an edging down and a far more slower sort of gradual uh, uh, thing out there. I don't see a return of the deflation excessively low inflation worries, which were dominant in the world following the global financial crisis. In New Zealand, for the past three decades, inflation has averaged 2.1% a year. Between 2012 and 2019, the average was only 1.2% a year. It was too low. The Reserve Bank had to keep cutting interest rates 1.75% over 2015-16 by another 0.75% in 2019 to try and generate inflation. We went into the pandemic with deflation being the concern of everybody out there. We were discussing uh, negative bank deposit rates in New Zealand. Are they going to happen, this sort of thing? Now, here's, I'm, I'm going to open it all up for questions and comments fairly, fairly uh, shortly, but here's a key recommendation I'd make to yourselves that are, are, are borrowers. You're looking at the interest rates. Oh, my goodness, 6% seems, seems so high. Completely forget the interest rates that you saw in the three year period from 2019, 20 into 2021. Those interest rates were massively unusual. They're not gonna be repeated again. I certainly hope for a great period of time. They were only low in 2019 at record lows then because of worries about deflation, specifically because the inflation number for the December quarter of 2018 was only 0.1%. And for the March quarter of 2019, again, it was only 0.1%. 
we were on the way to 0.4% annual inflation rate and it scared the Reserve Bank and so they slashed interest rates to try and avoid the disinflation, deflation scenario. And of course, interest rates only got pushed to new record lows, March, April 2020, because of the pandemic. You've got to take these things away. And I now and then will publish graphs which show the likes of the one-year fixed mortgage rate from 1992 or so. But I strip out the observations. There's nothing in there in the graph for 2019 through to 2021. And for your guide, where fixed mortgage rates sit at the moment, the one-year around 6%, the five-year 6.4%, a bit more, et cetera, that's fairly close to the average level for the 10 years ending in 2018. Now, where we sit now, I think, is above average. I think people have become more sensitive to interest rates. But key thing I want you to note here is that as each month goes by, yes, more people will roll on to a higher interest rate from 2.5%, 35 into 6%. And so, yes, we take that as a negative. But as each month goes by, more people will go, maybe this is the new normal. We will adapt we will start to believe this is where interest rates are going to be. Hey, and you know, my parents always talked about the 18% they paid back in 1988 and this sort of thing. We will start to assume it becomes the normal sort of thing. And when we're looking at something from a housing market point of view, there's something very important to keep in mind here. If you're thinking, oh, house prices still have a lot more to collapse away, all these poor young people, interest rates going high, there's another 10% downside. No, not necessarily. You see, First home buyers stepped forward into the property market again about four months ago for a number of reasons. I think A, getting used to the higher interest rates. B, house prices falling, so the house prices are getting uh, uh, cheaper. Uh, uh, C, the banks have been easing their lending criteria bit by bit every fortnight or month since about April. Uh, well, D, uh, Kainga Ora, homes and communities, uh, uh, it's easy to get some extra funding uh, out of them or the, the rules for borrowing money, et cetera, have improved there. There's also one other thing that people forget about, and I've already mentioned it. Our incomes for the average household have in fact gone up from a wages point of view, 8.6% in the past year, following an increase of three and a half, four percent a year before. House prices have gone down, but they're still 26% higher than pre-pandemic. And that's, that's, that's all you're going to think about. House prices, they've gone up so much, it's ridiculous. Household incomes have gone up 14, 1.4% in that period of time. At the end of last year, the ratio of house prices to household incomes was 33% above pre-pandemic levels. Now it's only 8% above. As each month goes by, people's income is basically going up and the house prices go down, whether it's lines crossing, however you want to think about it. But the affordability of housing is a heap of a lot better than I think people are realizing if they're only looking at the house price changes. So overall, look, I see the labour market tightness being a permanent thing for New Zealand. You're going to have to adapt your business in terms of meeting the, the demands increasingly of, of new staff and of existing staff. Do not forget your existing staff, because just like that, you could come in on a Monday morning and, and, and well, you might have had texts over the weekend, like relationships, they get ended with texts these days. Employment relationships, maybe somebody just texting, I'm out of here, man, either to Australia for two times the, the wage or down the road in New Zealand for 20 or 30% more. So keep an eye on, on that. You're going to have to focus your activity on your highest yielding products. Stop trying to produce everything for everybody out there when you can't even service properly your existing client base. You've got to rank everything you do, all your lowest yielding, loss-making products to your highest profit ones. Stop doing these things. Produce only these things. Boost your profit per unit of output. Boost your ability to pay um, higher uh, uh, wages. Your valuable labor resource is in these areas. And if you're an owner-operator, you might be getting by at the moment, you're able to meet customer demand, but when's the last time you had a holiday? Are you spending enough time with the spouse, the kids, et cetera, at the weekend? Are you actually working 70 or so hours a week? There's a bit of a mental health crisis, I think, brewing there for many people in the SME uh, area, all sectors across the country, because they're just running at an unsustainable pace. Nervous breakdowns, whatever it means, I think there is a bit of an issue out there. And even if you produce one product, you've got more than one customer, probably. You've got Customers who are a hassle to deal with, you've got to redo the job, uh, you're not making much money, do not service them any longer and focus on your highest yielding customers. It might be locations of distribution, locations of production. You've got to do these sort of stratification exercises out there for everything you do and you concentrate your work effort on your most profitable stuff, clients, locations, or whatever. That gets productivity up, 
you'll be able to handle things like short-term interest rates used to finance uh, your inventories that are rising at the moment, well, they're going to go higher. You'll be able to handle them a bit better if you stop producing you know, some of the lower yielding products. Now, I'm going to open it all up for questions, comments, et cetera there, Pierre, and uh, um, I'm going to switch it across to yourself to uh, maybe some people have sent through some questions. I saw some stuff popping up on the chat there. If anybody has a question, I believe uh, they can type it in in the chat thing. Am I correct, Pierre? Absolutely. I'll just read them out to you as they come, and then you can address the answer. Uh, meanwhile, we have, <laughs> apologies, a couple of three questions I would like to ask the audience, if you can take a minute to answer, and I will read out the first question from Anonymous. How do you think the workspace um, impacts uh, staff productivity, uh, which probably a very relevant question at the time with what we said about hybrid work? Yeah, yeah, staff productivity. I mean, it's proving uh, a bit more difficult to measure these days, especially when people are working from home as well as in the office. You need to actually know how many hours are people working. And, you know, there's increasing evidence that people are actually working more hours in their home than we, we sort of think they are at least you're on call, you're thinking about it the whole time. So I think calculating productivity measures, first of all, is, is extremely difficult when we have a hybrid mixture of in the office and working from home. So that's, that's the first thing uh, comment I would make there. Um, for the businesses, I think you sort of have to take very much a, a it's, it's really just the cost of the labor and the output coming out the other side there. I don't think you're actually going to be able to make the product productivity calculation of hours worked and the output that you get as a result of that. If I were, you know, employing a lot of people and there was that mixture going on, um, yeah, I'd be very much focused I, I, more than in the past on maybe people's mental health and well-being because they may be looking happy for three days in the office each week. Well, they're happy it's only three days, but what if their stress levels are building up because they're also juggling the very expensive childcare, they're doing some at home and you don't see them in the background on a Zoom call, the, the kiddies running around the back. I just I just think there are some issues that are starting to build up out there beyond just any productivity measures. But for productivity overall, you've got to be responsive, I think, increasingly to what this, the staff want. And if the young people want to be working more in the offices and the uh, evidence internationally is it's more the young people that want to come back in, social engagement, learning from people higher up you know, the, the ladder, et, et, et cetera, then maybe your office environments more reflect what they want Whereas the older people, they know how things work. They can sort of recite the rules and how you do things you know, uh, very easily. It's like it's easier for them to actually work at home than maybe some of the younger ones. So you've got to adjust for that early on from the working from home. There was that evidence and concern about people are no longer learning at the same pace as was the case previously. And just for your guide, learning means not just the rules of the business, how you make the widget. It's learning involves recognizing early on that what you're doing is wrong. It's like recognizing early on that somebody of you, the foreman, is putting the skirting board up in the house upside down. It's something going wrong as opposed to doing things right. That's what experience gives you. And I, and I think there's there, that could be a bit of a black spot, a black uh, a blind spot, sorry, for some people if they're uh, embracing a bit too much working from home. Yeah, and it's, um, thank you, Tony. We're seeing the same actually um, with, with our clients. Uh, a lot of them are actually adopting the office as a way to help young people learn and it's the younger generation who are want the most especially knowledge industries uh, to come to the office we have another question um again from anonymous do you think the construction market is likely to take a dip in new zealand like the uk is seeing over the midterm uh, two three years yeah, yeah, most definitely yeah, construction easing off, certainly residential, it's already underway for house building. So the number of consents issued for the building of standalone houses on a section peaked uh, six or eight months ago at about 26,000 annual number. We're down to, I think, 23,000 or so. So that's like a, a traditional thing. I would fully expect it to happen. I would expect that number to ease away, not plummet away, but ease lower. It hasn't even started happening for townhouses. The annual number there is still going up and up. And I think that's the sector in which there's been excessively optimistic 
undercapitalized um, development, you know, people coming in without the experience. That's where I think there's going to be a bit of blood in the water there. A lot of people have paid much too much for the development land and the numbers can no longer work with prices coming down, uh, the costs going up, they've paid too much, they can't hit the pricing points any longer. And across on the Gold Coast, where I spend a, a fair amount of time, there's uh, quite a number of large projects that uh, they're simply being cancelled. They're in the works there for two years, got the consents and anything, everything. They're not going ahead because given the increase in the construction costs in particular, they simply can't hit the pricing point any longer to be able to sell them and uh, make a profit. And they're giving the deposits back you know, to the people. They haven't, they haven't even started digging the hole in the sand yet. And they're, they're giving people the money back. So I just have uh, do think for the uh, townhouse development sector, there is a, a, a correction to come there. And there will be, even for building houses as well, um, a number of operators falling over. Last weekend or last week, it was a, a, a tiny house company, one building little houses. There's going to be more like that because whenever you get a construction boom in particular, and this has been a boom that started in late 2011 when the number of consents issued all around the country was less than 14,000. We're at almost 51,000 now. This has been going for 11 years. So a lot of undercapitalized and experienced people are in there. There is a weeding out coming along. But this isn't the 1970s when the consents went from 40,000 in 1973 to only 15,000 in 1979. It's, it's not that. There is a big requirement for social housing in New Zealand. There is a backlog of, of buyers, of, of young buyers as well. Um, and so, yeah, it's going to be edging off definitely. But it's not a 1970s collapse that's, that's coming along for construction. For other sorts of construction, I'm beginning to wonder, with evidence of inventories building up around the world, if the surge in construction of warehouses around the world might have peaked out as businesses now with their inventory financing costs going up, short-term interest rates, that uh, they're going to start to not completely move back to a just-in-time inventory management system, but I'm wondering if that construction peak might be near near the end uh, uh, in New Zealand. For the offices, well, maybe, certainly for maybe some specialised new modern offices, there's always a demand out there, but clearly we're, as corporates are having their leases uh, come up for renewal, they are going down to half the space or 70% of the space. There's probably a lot of that to come along in the near future. So outside maybe, you know, Wynyard Quarter, where there's you know, still a lot of development uh, uh, out there, I'm just wondering maybe for the office construction market, there's um, there could be sort of a, a just a weakish patch, nothing too major, um, because it's not driven by credit collapse, shall we say. Thank you for that, uh, Tony. One more question, which we'll try to answer briefly, and then um, we'll have a closing comments. But the question was, how do you think economic headwinds or be they mild or opportunities will affect climate change uh, fight ambitions or the, the ambitions governments have uh, to fight climate change? Yeah, well, one of the headwinds, of course, for the world is, is fighting clim climate change. I mean, we're always hearing about, we'll move to renewable energy. This is how they try and sell it in Australia. Renewable energy will be cheaper. If it was cheaper, it would already be get, be done. So that's just complete rubbish. Uh, it is going to be more expensive. In New Zealand, we don't feel this in our guts. We don't feel it because 85% of New Zealand's electricity generation is already renewable. Dams, 1950s, 60s, 70s. In Australia, 33%. They want to move to 82%. They need to build 44 gigawatt of renewable electricity generation in uh, eight years. And that includes stripping out about 15, 14 uh, uh, gigawatt of coal-fired generation they are taking offline. Um, so in some countries, you're already seeing Australia's electricity prices up about 25% the past year. It's expected another 35% in the, in the coming year through the roof in the UK and Europe as well. We're not seeing that um, in New Zealand. So those extra costs, of course, are going to be adding to inflation interest rates higher than would otherwise uh, be the case. But as the Reserve Bank of Australia, Philip Lowe uh, noted in a speech he gave yesterday, global inflation is also gonna be boosted um, by climate change causing the floods, which are just so devastating for regional um, New South Wales, Victoria, but Queensland as well. It's increasing the costs of everything um, out there. there are, they're increasingly uh, banning building on floodplains. The New South Wales government is buying out people's properties on floodplains. Myself, Two weeks ago, I spent $8,000 on a new culvert in my driveway. The existing culvert down the bottom of a big gully has been blocked up by slips caused by the change in the rain these days. It's heavier than it ever was. Earth is moving. And so I've had to get some guys in to go and dig a culvert higher up so that when the pond of water builds up in the next 
one and one or three year major downpour builds up, it's not going to top over the driveway, take out the asphalt topping, and then wipe out the massive bund that this 400 metre driveway is on, and I'm up for tens of thousands of dollars. So there's costs for individuals of adjusting to climate change. And for me, that is a part of it as well. So yes, mm. these are going to be a headwind. And if it was going to be beneficial for the economy, uh, productivity, we would already be doing, doing it. There is a cost to fighting climate change. We've definitely got to bear the cost, but we've got to recognize it for what it is. It's going to add to interest rates. It's going to mean reduced business profits in some regards, and it's going to crimp into household incomes over a great period of time. The fighting of it and the adapting to climate change as well. Thank you, Tony. It's a bit of short-term pain for long-term game, I would say, in this area. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks to everyone who has joined us. Uh, what is next at Studio DB? We'll be releasing our hybrid workspace guide 2022 very shortly in a couple of weeks. This will give practical insights on how companies can really leverage the hybrid work patterns uh, to benefit from. Uh, we'll be releasing very shortly our net zero fit out calculator. This is a piece of technology and knowledge we've put, developed to be able to give landlords and uh, tenants occupiers um, a read on how much their project is um, delivering in terms of carbon and the ability to design uh, to deliver net zero. We'll also be launching soon a no-brainer dashboard. This is a dashboard that's made for executives to be able to measure their real estate in real time and how their current portfolio compares to um, ideal benchmarks. And next year, we'll be doing state of hybrid surveys and workshops for companies. That's uh, us for today. And um, thank you very much, Tony. Thanks for everyone. Have a great day and all the best until Christmas. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.